All right, so. Okay, so if you guys have this assignment pulled up, it, you can see it looks like this. You've got some nice pictures. If you don't have it pulled up, it's called Comparing Jamestown and Plymouth 9-8. So you can just search by today's date in there. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple of memes to get us started and talk about the news. All right, so today what we will be doing is we're going to look at a brain pop. As We'll watch that as a class, then we'll watch a crash course. While we're watching the crash course, we're actually gonna follow along on a Google Doc, so you guys are going to have to write everything out. Please make sure that you are doing a good job with your sentences and writing because, um, of course, this is going to be for a grade. All right, here's our first memes. Me, girl, where's a hoodie? My girlfriend, is this for me? Oops. Me waiting on that cold front to get here. When it's been three days since the new month started and there still is no disaster. My wife yelled from upstairs and asked, do you ever get a shooting of pain across your body? Like somebody's got a voodoo doll of you and they're stabbing it? I replied, no. She responded, how about now? Eek. All right, so we're gonna watch these videos. Um, make sure you guys complete your notes as we go along. Oops, wrong button. So if you guys are on the on the Canvas assignment, you can see here at the top, there are a couple pictures of Jamestown. Like I mentioned before, it was picked on a spot that they thought was very defensible. So you can see there's they built a lot of like walls and other defenses. But if we take down, look at this picture, um, the main reason that Jamestown was chosen as a spot is because it was kind of isolated. So you can see that there's not very many ways to get into the colony since it's surrounded on three sides by water. Unfortunately, this also meant that Jamestown was on a really swampy area that didn't have um, good drainage. And there were just tons and tons of mosquitoes that lived there and they, those mosquitoes carried malaria. So malaria is actually gonna kill a huge number of the inhabitants of Jamestown in that first year, which is something that we will talk about in a little bit today. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna watch this brain pop. You guys can sit back and relax for this part. Um, you are you don't need to take any notes until the second portion of it. Refresh video. You thought the House of Burgesses was a restaurant? Well, that's no reason to give them a bad Yawp review. This was the first legislature in the 13 colonies. Uh, dear Tim and Moby, our teacher says we're going to study the regions of the 13 colonies. Why were they divided up like that? From Mia and Phoebe. Hey there. Historians talk about the American colonies in terms of three regions. The New England colonies, which included Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. The Middle colonies, made up of Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. And the Southern colonies of Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. In reality, the colonies weren't actually divided up into regions. 
It's just an idea that was invented to help us understand what life was like back then. The colonies in each region shared certain things in common, similar climates, economies, cultures, and populations. So instead of trying to remember stuff about 13 places, we can simplify it to three. A colony is a territory that a country controls outside its own borders. The country is enriched by the land and other resources of the colony. That's what England was thinking when it sent colonists to America. It staked its first claim way back in 1607 in Jamestown, Virginia. Of course, native people had already been living there for thousands of years. But that didn't stop England from laying claim to the land. In a little over a century, they'd spread out to 12 other territories up and down the East Coast. No, Native Americans didn't just give up their land without a fight. But a couple of factors tipped the odds in England's favor. For one, colonists carried diseases that Native people had no resistance to. Within a few decades, most of them died, leaving few to fight against the invaders. The English also had guns and other advanced military technology. By the mid-1600s, they were doing big business up and down the coast. And from the start, that business depended on geography. The southern colonies had a warm climate, flat land, and rich soil. So, commercial farming ruled. They grew cash crops, produce grown specifically to be sold for profit. Tobacco filled the fields of Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. In the swampy land of South Carolina and Georgia, they grew rice and indigo, a valuable fabric dye. The lower south was marked by massive farms called plantations. These operations were like little towns with houses, work buildings, shops, churches, and roads. Yeah, growing cash crops required a ton of laborers. And working the fields was brutal. People weren't exactly lining up for these jobs. Plantation owners turned to slavery, which quickly spread across the South. People were captured in warfare in West Africa, then sold in slave markets. Then they were shipped across the Atlantic, packed like cargo below decks. For the rest of their lives, they labored under grueling conditions. Any children they had were born into a life of slavery, too. By the mid-1700s, nearly half the population in the South was enslaved. This giant, free workforce made a handful of southern planters incredibly rich. They became a powerful class, running local politics and the church. But even small-time farmers who worked their own fields used slave labor if they could afford it. Right, slavery wasn't as widespread up north. The New England colonies were founded as religious communities. So many of its settlers viewed slavery as immoral. But there was also a more practical reason. The North's cold climate and rocky soil weren't ideal for large plantations. Most people made their livings on family farms, feeding themselves on the produce and selling off anything extra. Others sought their fortune on the sea. Fishing and whaling industries took off. Along with shipbuilding, made with lumber from the area's dense forests. Unlike in the rural South, New Englanders lived close together in villages. Each village had a meeting house where everyone attended church. They set up public schools so every kid could learn to read the Bible. Village councils imposed all kinds of rules to create a society that was pure in the eyes of God. Like on Sundays, you couldn't work, do chores, or hang out with friends. Rhode Island was one exception. Their government and church were separate, and people of all faiths were welcomed. Actually, that kind of tolerance was much more common in the middle colonies. Much of the region started off as the Dutch colony of New Netherland. It was a commercial outpost focused on the fur trade. The mother country, the Netherlands, was a thriving, stable nation. Not many people were eager to pick up and start new lives an ocean away. So the Dutch recruited settlers from all over Europe. That's how New Netherland ended up with Germans, Swedes, Scots, Irish, and French settlers, unlike the other regions where almost all the settlers were British. In the capital of New Amsterdam, as many as 18 languages were spoken. When England took over and renamed the colony New York, the diversity remained. Over in Pennsylvania, tolerance for different religions and backgrounds was a core value. 
It was founded by the Quakers, a Christian group who accepted everyone as equals. Yep, the economy of the middle colonies depended a lot on its location, uh, in the middle. It enjoyed the best of both neighboring regions. Success in farming, like the South, and industry, like the North. The fertile soil was perfect for planting grains, mostly on small plots of land. Milling that grain became big business, too. The middle colonies even got the nickname the breadbasket. The port cities of New York and Philadelphia grew into huge trade hubs. With a little luck and hard work, poor immigrants could make their fortunes in those places. Yeah, immigrants still come here for the exact same reason. And some of the regional differences that began back then persist to this day. Like, southern states still have tons of rural land, while states in the mid-Atlantic and northeast are more urban. Traveling between these places can feel like you're visiting different countries, even though they're all a part of the United States. But back then, the colonies weren't yet states, and they definitely weren't united. Most people hardly ever left the place they were born. So they didn't think of themselves as American colonists. They were Virginians, New Yorkers, Massachusetts. It's hard to believe they ever managed to band together and break free from England. Well, what do you know? Um, one double cheeseburgess with fries, please? And can you tell me what's in the Bacon's Rebellion? All right, so that was the brain pop. <clears throat> so for this next part of class, we are gonna use the Google Doc that you guys have. So if you scroll down to the very bottom, you can see that there is a Google Doc down here. Um, it's embedded into Canvas, so you can go ahead and fill it out on here. Or if you want it to be a little bit bigger, you can go ahead and click this and it'll open up into a new tab when you are done with it you're going to have a little bit of homework tonight so when you're done with your homework you're going to come down to the bottom and click submit down here in the bottom right but if you guys look at the questions you can see that there are about seven questions that we will do together and what you guys are going to do is right down here where it says type your answers here you're going to answer the question <laughs> <coughs> And then for tonight's homework, what you're going to do is you're going to answer these five things that compare Jamestown and Plymouth. We should have gotten over these um, already. Most of them are in the crash course, but feel free to look them up if you would like to, okay? So what we'll first do is, let me see, we're going to start by watching the video with Al Green. He goes pretty quickly but we will pause it and talk about the important stuff as it goes. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to tell the story of how a group of plucky English people struck a blow for religious freedom and founded the greatest, freest, and fattest nation the world has ever seen. These Brits entered a barren land containing no people and quickly invented the automobile, baseball, and Star Trek, and we all lived happily ever after. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, if it's really that simple, I am so getting an A in this class. Oh, me from the past. You're just a delight. <laughs> So most Americans grow up hearing that the United States was founded by pasty English now. people who came here to escape religious persecution. And that's true of the small proportion of people who settled in the Massachusetts Bay and created what we now know as New England. But these pilgrims and Puritans, there's a difference, weren't the first people or even the first Europeans to come to the only part of the globe we didn't paint over. In fact, they weren't even the first English people. The first English people came to Virginia. Off topic, but how weird is it that the first permanent English colony in the Americas was named not for Queen Elizabeth's epicness, but for her supposed supposed chastity. Right, anyway, those first English settlers weren't looking for religious freedom. They wanted to get rich. So the first successful English colony in America was founded at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. I say successful because there were two previous attempts to colonize the region. They were both epic failures, the more famous of which was the colony at Roanoke Island, set up by Sir Walter Raleigh, which is famous because all the colonists disappeared, leaving only the word Croaton carved into a tree. <laughs> Jamestown was a project of the Virginia Company, which existed to make money for its investors, something it never 
ever did. The hope was that they would find gold in the Chesapeake region like the Spanish had in South America, so there were a disproportionate number of goldsmiths and jewelers there to fancy up that gold, which of course did not exist. Anyway. All right, so this is gonna be our first answer. So what you guys are gonna do is you're gonna come over to your Google Doc and then you're gonna type out the answer. So what were the motivations of the Jamestown settlers? And their motivation was money. They came here to get money. So remember, the Jamestown colony is started by the Virginia Company. And just like any other company, the main motivation of that the Virginia Company is to make money. And so they are coming to Jamestown for economic reasons. They're coming here trying to make money. So you guys can open up that Google Doc. I'm going to do this copy of mine, which I tried to fix. You guys should have your Google Doc open. I'm going to open up my copy of a copy of a copy because otherwise I'll just destroy all of my hard work. My internet is having a very hard time keeping up. It says unit one access denied. Tanaka, you should be only pulling up the assignment for today, nine eight. All right, so it asks, what were the motivations of the Jamestown settlers? So their motivations were economic, right? They were part of the Virginia Company and they were coming here to make money. All right, so what I wrote down, and you guys can feel free to copy what I put for these ones, or you can write your own. I said, the Jamestown settlers were motivated by money. They were part of the Virginia company who was trying to make a profit. All right, our next question is, what was the head right system? But I'll give you guys a second or two to catch up with me. Emily, the assignment is in Canvas. The assignment's called Comparing Jamestown and Plymouth 9-8. So you can pull it up in Canvas. It's hard if you're late to class. All right. So you guys got this part so far? You got wrote down what I wrote down? Give me a thumbs up if we're ready to move along. Thumbs up. Yep, okay, thank you, Noah. All right, here we go. So what was the head right system? That's what we're listening for now. Well, it turns out that jewelers dislike farming, so much so that Captain John Smith, who soon took over control of the island, once said that they would rather starve than farm. So in the first year, half of the colonists died. 400 replacements came, but by 1610, after a gruesome winter called the Starving Time, the number of colonists had dwindled to 65. And eventually word got out that the New World's one-year survival rate was like 20% and it became harder to find new colonists. But in 1618, the Virginia Company hit upon a recruiting strategy called the Headright System, which offered 50 acres of land for each person that a settler paid to bring over. And this enabled the creation of a number of large estates, which were mostly worked on and populated by indentured servants. Indentured All right, so what John Al Green just told us, or John Green just told us, is that they came up with the headright system. So the headright system was basically an incentive program made by the Virginia company to get people to move to their colony. So let's think about for a second in Jamestown that first year, right? We have about four to 500 people who land and start the colony, but within one year, there are only 65 people left. That means about 25, like 80% of people will die. Only 20 to 25% of people are going to survive the first year in this new colony. Now, you can imagine pretty quickly after word of this gets around in England, not many people want to move to this colony where everybody dies, right? So the way that they are able to entice people to come here is pretty similar to the way people, we had people do it in Texas history. They're going to offer them land grants in order to move into the colonies. And this headright system is going to be that. They're going to give people 50 acres of land if they move to the colony and work as a servant for usually about seven years. 
So I'm gonna write, what was the head right system? So I'm gonna say the head right system gave land grants to colonists after about seven years of work. And during those seven years, they're basically gonna be working as slaves or as indentured servants, but they don't have very many rights. They can't go anywhere. All that they're doing for all the, of those seven years is working on somebody else's farm or plantation. So the head right system gave land grants to colonists after about seven years of work. And this is really going to change things. It's, and it's gonna be a huge like reason that people are gonna start moving to um, the Jamestown colony. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds to get that typed up. All right, here we go. Indentured servants weren't quite slaves, but they were kind of temporary slaves, like they could be bought and sold and they had to do what their masters commanded. But after seven to 10 years of that, if they weren't dead, they were paid their freedom dues, which they hoped would allow them to buy farms of their own. Sometimes that worked out, but often either the money wasn't enough to buy a farm or else they were too dead to collect it. Even more ominously, in 1619, just 12 years after the founding of Jamestown, the first shipment of African slaves arrived in Virginia. So the colony probably would have continued to struggle along if they they hadn't found something that people really loved. Tobacco. Tobacco had been grown in Mexico since at least 1000 BCE, but the Europeans had never seen it, and it proved to be kind of a thank you for the smallpox, here's some lung cancer gift from the natives. Interestingly, King James hated smoking. He called it a custom loathsome to the <laughs> eye and hateful to the nose, but he loved him some tax revenue, and nothing sells like drugs. By All right, so what... Um, Al Green is telling us there is tobacco is going to be the thing that saves Jamestown. So in, in the 1620s, Virginia and their colonies are selling about 50,000 pounds of tobacco. 70 years later, or not even 60 years later, they will be selling 30 million pounds of tobacco. So over the course of 1620 to 1680, the amount of tobacco that they sell goes from 50,000 to 30 million. So if you think about that in math terms, it is a huge increase in tobacco sales. And this is gonna be the thing that really saves the Jamestown colony. So I'm gonna say the Jamestown colony was saved by the farming of tobacco that was then sold back in England. And England and the rest of Europe are just gonna go crazy for tobacco and tons of people are gonna buy it, and it's gonna mean that lots of people in these southern colonies, well, not lots of people, but a few people in these southern colonies will become very wealthy. And that's one of the things that we start to see in these southern colonies develop is, as people are brought here, they're brought as servants or slaves. So really, we only have few people who are in charge of most of the power and wealth, and they are the plantation owners. So you can go ahead and type in the Jamestown colony was saved by the farming of tobacco that was then sold back to England. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds and then we'll go to the next one. All right, here we go. By 1624, Virginia was producing more than 200,000 pounds of tobacco per year. By the 1680s, more than 30 million pounds per year. Tobacco was so profitable that colonists created huge plantations with very little in the way of towns or infrastructure to hold the social order together, a strategy that always works out brilliantly. The industry also structured Virginian society. First off, most of the people who came in the 17th century, three quarters of them, were servants. So Virginia became a microcosm of England, a small class of wealthy landowners sitting atop a mass of servants. That sounds kind of dirty. 
but it was mostly just sad. The society was also overwhelmingly male because male servants were more useful in the tobacco fields. They were the greatest proportion of immigrants. In fact, they outnumbered women five to one. The women who did come over were mostly indentured servants, and if they were to marry, which they often did because they were in great demand, they had to wait until their term of service was off. This meant delayed marriage, which meant fewer children, which further reduced the number of females. Life was pretty tough for these women, but on the upside, Virginia was kind of a swamp of pestilence, so their husbands often died. And that created a small class of widows, or even unmarried women, who, because of their special status, could make contracts and own property, so that was good, sort of. Okay, a quick word about Maryland. Maryland was this... Alright, so there was another thing important in there. So one of the things that I just mentioned is... At what are all these people coming here to Jamestown to do? So the vast majority of colonists coming to Jamestown were going to work as farmers. So I'm going to say the vast majority of settlers coming to Jamestown were, would work as farmers. And this is going to kind of create some problems in their society. right? I mentioned just a second ago that there are going to be a few wealthy, large landowners controlling a lot of these southern colonies. These are going to become our plantation owners. But the vast majority of people who are coming here are being brought over as indentured servants. So they're going to work seven years on somebody else's farm or as slaves. And that means the rest of their own life and the rest of their children's life will be worked on somebody else's farm as a slave. So the vast majority of these people coming to Jamestown are going to work as farmers. And this is going to kind of create a weird society where we have very few people on the top and the vast majority of people are going to be poor beneath them. All right, so they're gonna start talking about Plymouth and the Maryland colonies and you need to pay attention for what were the motivations. Second Chesapeake Colony founded in 1632, and by now there was no messing around with joint stock companies. Maryland was a proprietorship, a massive land grant to a single individual named Cecilius Calvert. Calvert wanted to turn Maryland into like a medieval feudal kingdom to benefit himself and his family, and he was no fan of the representational institutions that were developing in Virginia. Also, Calvert was Catholic, and Catholics were welcome in Maryland, which wasn't always the case elsewhere. Speaking of which, let's talk Talk about Massachusetts. So Jamestown might have been the first English colony, but Massachusetts Bay is probably better known. This is largely because the colonists who came there were so recognizable for their beliefs and also for their hats. That's right, I'm talking about the Pilgrims and the Puritans. And no, I will not be talking about Thanksgiving, is a lie. I can't help myself, but only to clear up the difference between Pilgrims and Puritans and also to talk about Squanto. God, I love me some Squanto. Let's go to the thought bubble. Most of the English men and women who settled in New England were uber Protestant Puritans who believed the Protestant Church of England was still too catholic -y with its kneeling and incense and extravagantly happy. Okay, so let's fill out our next couple of questions. So the motivations of the Plymouth settlers were religious, right? So what they were talking about in there were both the Puritans and the Pilgrims were fleeing England because of religious persecution. Remember, religious persecution is when somebody is being attacked because of their religion. So all of these settlers are coming over to the United States and they're setting up a colony where they'll be able to just live their lives and practice their religion as they want to. So what we're going to put down is what were the motivations of the Plymouth settlers? I'm going to say religious freedom motivated the Plymouth settlers to create a colony in Massachusetts. All right. And as you guys can imagine, like if we think about this for a second, right, it, this is going to create a pretty different sort of environment. If in the Jamestown colonies, all of the settlers are coming there and they're coming there for economic reasons, right, they're coming there to farm tobacco, tobacco to sell back in England, they're going to have different motivations, different desires, and just live their lives differently than somebody who's just coming here to live and practice their religion freely. So we will see some of those themes start to play out as we look at these um, colonies developed. All right. So your what were the motivations of the Plymouth settlers? Religious freedom motivated the Plymouth settlers to create a colony in Massachusetts.
added archbishops, the particular Puritans, who by the way did not call themselves that, other people did, who settled in New England were called Congregationalists because they thought congregations should determine leadership and worship structures, not bishops. The Pilgrims were even more extreme. They wanted to separate more or less completely from the Church of England. So first they fled to the Netherlands, but the Dutch were apparently too corrupt for them, so they rounded up investors and financed a new colony in 1620. They were supposed to land in Virginia, but in what perhaps should have been taken as an omen, they were blown wildly off course and ended up in what's now Massachusetts, founding a colony called Plymouth. While still on board their ship, the Mayflower, 41 of the 150 or so colonists wrote and signed an agreement called the Mayflower Compact, in which they all bound themselves to follow, quote, just and equal laws that their chosen representatives would write up. Since this was the first written framework for government in the U.S., it's kind of a big deal. But anyway, the Pilgrims had the excellent fortune of landing in... All right, so there's the answer for our next question. Why was the Mayflower Compact a big deal? And I'm going to say the Mayflower Compact was the first written form of government in the U.S. Right? And that's going to be a big deal because obviously eventually we become our own country. And so people look back at this and say, oh, yes, there was the first time we thought about doing this. All right, so you guys can go ahead and write that one down and then we'll answer this last question as well. Okay, so this last question, we're gonna just, you're gonna have to think about it just a tiny bit. So it asks, what was the, what was different in the Plymouth colony than in Jamestown? Think about who owns the colony and what the purpose of the colony was. So I mentioned this just a minute ago, but it's important enough that we're gonna talk about it two, two times. So let's think about the Plymouth colony and the Jamestown colony's motivations, right? Plymouth, the people were coming for religious freedom and Jamestown, people were coming to make money. So as you can imagine, that really is going to change the way that these colonies develop. For one thing, Plymouth, or Jamestown, I'm sorry, for one thing, Jamestown is run by the Virginia Company. And that means that there's a person back in England who's basically in charge. So if they run out of supplies or if they need something, they're going to have to go through that company. The company is also going to have representatives on the ground in their colony who are basically going to be in charge of law and order. On the other hand, Plymouth was founded on people seeking religious freedom. And that means that the people aren't really tied back to England the way that the Jamestown colonists are. This means that they'll have a lot more autonomy or they'll be able to make decisions for themselves. And we'll also see a bit more democratic ideals at play in um, Plymouth than we will in Jamestown. So I'm gonna say the Plymouth colonists were motivated by religious freedom. That meant They were not bound to a company or trying to make money. The Jamestown colony was created by the Virginia company who would control a lot of their, I'm just gonna say day-to-day -day activities, right? So the Virginia Company is really going to have a lot more control over the uh, Jamestown Colony than somebody in the Plymouth Colony would see. All right, so what was different in the Plymouth Colony than in Jamestown? So I said the Plymouth colonists were motivated by religious freedom. That meant they were not bound to a company or trying to make money. The Jamestown Colony was created by the Virginia Company who would control a lot of their day-to-day -day activities. And that's not it, we just have another bell here. Okay, so you guys for the homework tonight are going to fill out this chart. Most of this stuff is stuff we already talked about or it's things that went over in the crash course. So you're gonna do your best to fill it out. If you are unsure, you can go ahead and look things up. I won't be mad about that. But it's gonna ask you five basic questions. On the left-hand side, you're gonna answer for Jamestown. And then on the right-hand side, you're gonna answer for limit. 
and this should just help bring you back. So let's see, we've got four minutes left in um, the class. I'm gonna play a couple more minutes of this and then we will be done. But make sure you get that item turned in for homework. Oh no. was that their religious mission wasn't really one of individualism, but of collective effort. In other words, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. But this city on a hill metaphor is the basis for one kind of American exceptionalism, the idea that we are so special and so godly that we will be a model to other nations. At least as long, according to Winthrop, as we act together. Lest you think Winthrop's words were forgotten, they did become the centerpiece of Ronald Reagan's 1989 farewell address. Okay, so New England towns were governed democratically, but that doesn't mean that the Puritan were big on equality or that everybody was able to participate in government because no. The only people who could vote or hold office were church members, and to be a full church member, you had to be a, quote, visible saint. So really, power stayed in the hands of the church elite. The same went for equality. While it was better than in the Chesapeake colonies or England, as equality went, it was pretty unequal. As John Winthrop declared, some must be rich and some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in subjection. Or as historian Eric Foner put it, inequality was considered an expression of God's will, and while some liberties applied to all inhabitants, there were separate lists of rights for freemen, women, children, and servants. There was also slavery in Massachusetts. The first slaves were recorded in the colony in 1640. However, Puritans really did foster equality in one sense. They wanted everyone to be able to read the Bible. In fact, parents could be punished by the town councils for not properly instructing their children and making them literate. But when Roger Williams called for citizens to be able to practice any religion they chose, he was banished from the colony. So was Anne Hutchinson, who argued that church membership should be based on inner grace and not on outward manifestations like church attendance. Williams went on to found Rhode Island, so that worked out fine for him. But Hutchinson, who was doubly threatening to Massachusetts because she was a woman preaching unorthodox ideas, was too radical and was further banished to Westchester, New York, where she and her family were killed by Indians. Finally, someone who doesn't die of disease or starvation. So America... All right, guys. So that is about all we have for class. You guys can go ahead and have a great day. Um, please make sure you get that item turned in. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. Uh, Mr. Swoveland? Yeah. Uh, can you open up the, the comparing James Brown and find out on your screen again? Because uh, I was in the middle of typing the seven. Sure. Uh,